Hi everybody. Today we're talking about one of my absolute uh, favorite horror novels uh, of all time. Certainly one of the most impactful uh, novels of the last 50 years. Uh, the Shining. Um, by Stephen King, published in uh, 1977. King himself um, has called this you know, his masterpiece acknowledges that it's one of those rare opportunities or rare moments in a writer's life where they just know uh, that they've done something really significant. Um, and he did this fairly early in his career, uh, shortly after he had published his first breakout novel, uh, or novella, Carrie. Um, interest, some interesting points. Uh, of background before we jump right into the heart of the novel itself and discussing some of its major themes. Um, first, the storied history of uh, Stephen King versus Stanley Kubrick, um, the director who filmed the uh, the film The Shining, probably J Jack Nicholson starring in it, probably the one you are the most uh, familiar with. Um, there are many differences between the novel and the film, and not only just in terms of minor details, but actually in terms of the substance, exactly what is haunting uh, the Overlook Hotel, and uh, how can human beings respond to it. There's a very different worldview at work behind King's novel and Kubrick's yeah. film. So we really want to... Uh, we'd find it interesting to consider where this feud began. There's a long history of it. A, a recent documentary came out um, on the myths and legends that are behind uh, this feud. Eventually, uh, Stephen King had to come to an agreement um, that he would no longer bash the Kubrick version of his uh, novel. It was a legal binding argument that said uh, King would have to cease and desist from criticizing Kubrick's film. Um, and as a response, King uh, proactively decided to uh, take one dollar uh, in exchange for the rights to his novels as long as he had some degree of creative control uh, over how the novel would be put into film or television. Another interesting biographical note about Stephen King, probably the most prolific horror writer uh, working today and has been for the past several decades. Um, he is, in this novel, I think, he's maybe expressing, or he's at his most autobiographical. King uh, struggled with substance abuse early on uh, when he was struggling to become a writer. Um, his family uh, was struggling to make ends meet, and he uh, had issues with substance abuse. Here in Jack Torrance, we see some direct parallels um, and some anxieties that King himself must have felt about providing for his family, the burden of having to provide for his family, um, and the struggles to be a writer while dealing with uh, the muddiness and the all-consuming um, nature of substance abuse. So, we can understand a little bit about why King wrote The Shining, or what it says about uh, his own demons, so to speak. Um, let's move on to talk about the Overlook Hotel. I would argue that there are a number of main characters here, but perhaps none more important or more substantial than the Overlook Hotel itself. It sits at the very center, and it has its own life, its own character. Um, it is probably the most menacing monster that we have encountered. Um, it's put on page 213, this inhuman place makes human monsters. Um, there's something about the place itself. It consumes people. Uh, it brings them into itself. It saps their energy. It feeds off of their 
uh, fears and their creativity and their psychic power. Um, so the overlook is an absolutely crucial element of The Shining that we have to unpack a little bit. It represents many different things. Um, at the heart of this, I would say this is one of the most profoundly American of all American uh, or of all horror novels, period. It expresses a direct fear of everything that is wrong or that has been done wrong in American history. Um, as it, on page 281, King writes that the hotel is, quote, an index of the whole post-World War II American character. So clearly, when we look at the Overlook and we analyze the many different permutations of its supernatural uh, menace, we're also looking directly at the unsavory side of America, period. Um, especially in the post-World War II era, there's something at the heart or in the basement of uh, the overlook that must be brought to bear that is going to return from its repression. And it, in this case, it is many, many different things. There's not only one. In The Black Cat, it was slavery. Um, in this case, we're talking about a myriad of different offenses that lay buried in the uh, boxes, the dusty boxes in the basement of American life. Um, it represents the, the weightiness of a corrupt America, according to uh, Jack Torrance, who acknowledges this corruption early on in the novel. Um, 239. This passage, I hope, will remind you of Lovecraft, uh, The Rats in the Walls, the sense of history, American history, here having a tremendous weight that bears down on the individual, that the individual, once they become aware of the transgressions of the ancestors, it becomes almost overwhelming um, to deal with. So, page 239, quote, he could almost, meaning Jack, could almost feel the weight of the overlook bearing down on him from above. 110 guest rooms, the storage rooms, kitchen, pantry, freezer, lounge, ballroom, dining room. And it goes on. So, he literally and figuratively feels the weight of the overlook um, and all of the things that have gone wrong there. Remember, he's compiling this scrapbook. And the scrapbook, which we don't actually see in the film version, in the novel, the scrapbook is a key moment for Jack Torrance when he goes to the basement and he starts realizing the level of corruption, um, the level of the kind of mafia-run uh, underbelly of the Overlook. Once he realizes it's not the pristine, ideal America that it was being sold uh, to travelers, he gets kind of enmeshed in it. He gets enraptured by it, and he begins to see all of the haunted uh, elements of the past within this one building, the history of this one artifice, which is the Overlook slash the United States. Um, it also is interesting because I think, uh, from a literary standpoint, King is addressing all of the Gothic forebearers, especially the American Gothic forebearers, that came before him, and that weighs just as heavily um, on his mind. This is on page 232. Dinner at eight, unmasking at midnight. He could almost see them in the dining room, the richest men in America and their women. Tuxedos and glimmering starched shirts, evening gowns, the band playing, gleaming high-heeled pumps, the clink of glasses, the jocund pop of champagne corks, the war was over, or almost over. The future lay ahead, clean and shining. America was the colossus of the world, and at last she knew it and accepted it. And later, at midnight, Derwent himself crying, Unmask! Unmask! The masks coming off, and the Red Death held sway over all. He frowned. What left field had that come out of? That was Poe, the great American hack. 
And surely the overlook, this shining, glowing overlook on the invitation he held in his hands, was the farthest cry from E.A. Poe imaginable. And so, Poe himself enters into the unconscious of Jack Torrance, uh, The Mask of the Red Death, a story you may well be familiar with, which is really a story of rich people who hold themselves up and have an elaborate party while the rest of the world crumbles around them. Um, so clear parallels to what was happening in the Overlook in the post-World War II period. America, the great colossus, um, wealth to be had, fame, fortune, luxury, excess. Um, and that's something that you could clearly define the character of the Overlook, excess. Um, alcoholic excess, sexual excess, excess everywhere. Um, and so beneath this colossus, the Red Death holds sway over all. There's something ill, there's something diseased in the foundation of this structure. Um, something hidden that we're not supposed to see, but that is slowly eating away at the beams that are holding everything up. Um, and so King very much indebted to his literary ancestors in the horror genre, recognizes that it is once more to his ancestors that he must turn. They come pouring back on him just as the other ancestors come pouring in on the overlook. Let's discuss some of the social issues here, because what exactly are the wrongs? What What is returning from repression? If the overlook is America, or is a stand-in, a microcosm, for America. What are some of the issues that come back to haunt the Torrance family? Um, well, first and foremost, uh, the woman at the end of the novel, um, who Halloran sees in the airport, says, the CIA has been at the root of every dirty little war America has fought. That's on page 516. Um, so, this section isn't just King wasting time. Uh, this is a section, you know, delaying us as Halloran is struggling to get to the Overlook. Here, clearly, um, the woman recognizes Halloran himself as a victim of the CIA and its dirty little wars. That uh, parallel is drawn to once more be critical of the underbelly here. So, CIA, the a corrupt government, uh, is one thing that's haunting the Overlook. Another thing, the wasps. The wasps have a very psychic, uh, a very symbolic value. Um, remember that Jack brings the wasps into Danny's room, uh, supposedly unknowingly, and these wasps sting Danny. The wasps appear over and over again. Important to note here, wasps is also a slang term for uh, rich white men. They're known as uh, wasps. And that is significant because that is, the Overlook's monsters are wasps here, both literally in the flying creatures and metaphorically uh, in the allusion to rich white men who are out to attack uh, the Torrens family. Another line, 191, that seems like a throwaway line, but as we are attentive readers, we start to recognize the many layers of haunting that are going on here. Red rum sounds like something an Indian might say on the warpath. So the overlook has been built over uh, Indian land. It was cleared and destroyed, and the Indian population displaced. We know, of course, from Hawthorne and others, the presence of Native Americans in the American unconscious is always an active role because it is the first massive, great hypocrisy and stain on the reputation of the Colossus that is the United States. Uh, its history has that blood on its hands. That is one thing that is lurking in the basement. Um, of the of the nation's past. So, CIA, wasps, rich white men, 
uh, the execution and displacement of Native American populations. And finally, and perhaps most uh, importantly, we have Ullman, who is the very uptight, puritanical, repressive uh, boss. And this boss is characterized as being a consummate businessman. Ullman would have hired the Boston Strangler if he'd worked for minimum wage. That's on page 31. Ullman is a stooge, a lackey for the, uh, the upper class, the upper up, the richest and most powerful. Um, and so he's the one who is kind of left to maintain the illusion of the pristine, shining overlook slash America. Um, but at the base of this, there is a certain, if you're going to be on the side of the overlook, uh, you must come around from recognizing yourself as the oppressed. Early on, Jack sees himself as the victim of, of people like Ullman and the rich. He feels put upon, exploited, uh, undervalued. If you're going to become a stooge or a lackey for the overlook, you're going to have to recognize uh, that you will have to sympathize with the master and not sympathize with the enslaved commoners. Um, this is on page 390. This is about Jack, and this is the play he's writing. In the beginning, he had wanted to use his play as a microcosm to say something about the abuse of power. Now he tended more and more to see Denker as a Mr. Chips figure, and the tragedy was not the intellectual racking of Gary Benson, but rather the destruction of a kindly old teacher and headmaster, unable to see through the cynical wiles of this monster masquerading as a boy. Just as there's a generational gap here, there's a threat that the next generation will overthrow the older generation, Jack must come around to siding with the uh, American aristocrats if he is going to serve them. Um, so Jack is under the delusion that perhaps doing the bidding of the Overlook will allow him entrance into the upper class, which we know is not the case. He will always be a caretaker or a butler, uh, such as the phantoms he meets in, in the bar, in the ballroom. Um, but we do know that he very much wants to ascend to that level, and that is the kind of great tragedy of The Shining. He is struggling very much to join the class of the masters, um, but he is nothing more than a pawn or a slave. And so this is a direct critique of American uh, social classes and class warfare, um, in that you have the working class, Jack Torrance being the figurehead of that, struggling to gain recognition, to be treated with respect, to be let into the party, basically. He just wants to join the party and have fun and let loose. Um, the problem is he's not allowed entrance into that. Uh, he's stuck toiling away in domestic servitude. Um, and even if he could get into it, I think a larger point of The Shining, even if you enter into that class, you must do the bloody, dirty deeds um, that the American aristocrats, the corrupt businessmen and, and the like, are accused of doing in uh, the history of the Overlook. So you must either embrace the oppression or you must become an oppressor yourself, and that makes you, transforms you into a monster of sorts. All right, let's talk for a minute then, now that we've kind of unpacked a little bit about uh, what in American past is haunting the very uh, American Overlook Hotel. Let's talk a little bit about the form. You'll notice that the form is a little bit unusual. Um, King uses parentheses and italics uh, and capital letters to make sure that his readers enter into this code switching mode that's going on here. He, the conscious world is constantly being flooded with these unconscious messages, either from the past or from the future. And that's 
absolutely essential to understanding why The Shining is innovative, not only in content, but in, in moreover in form. Here you have, it no longer matters uh, if things are returning from repression in the past or returning from repression in the future. Much of this is you're being haunted by things that are yet to come. This marks The Shining as one of the prototypical postmodern horror films. And I'm not going to get too much into what the postmodern is. Some of you already know that who have been in uh, English classes with me. Um, others of you will probably uh, not be terribly interested in, in hearing a lot more about it. But if you are, look it up. Uh, what I will say about it is, in the postmodern age, people are so consumer-driven. They are so driven by the logic of buying things that it no longer matters to think about the past or the future. Everything is just kind of flat. Everything is for sale. Uh, the past is a commodity. The future is a commodity, so we no longer think about time as a kind of linear trajectory. Time becomes more of a kind of flat surface on which everything is available and for sale. Um, and so what makes this interesting, uh, the, the form of this novel interesting, is that it is haunted from all directions. It is not just, as we've seen previously, the past returning from repression. Here, repression is uh, everywhere. It is timeless. Uh, in some ways, the overlook is all times, all places. Um, it is self-enclosed bubble uh, of American. The Colossus becomes kind of a prison in which you cannot imagine anything outside of the Colossus. And that's the postmodern condition. There's nothing outside. Everything is enclosed on itself and uh, already familiar. All right. Jumping ahead, uh, unfortunately, I mean, we could talk probably for hours and hours about The Shining, and I would be happy to do this. Um, let's talk a little about Halloran. Uh, Two things about Halloran. First, um, this is a main difference between Kubrick and King. At the end, King makes a point of drawing attention to Halloran's various assistants, the people who help Halloran to get back to the Overlook, people who lend him their mittens, make sure to go out of their way to give them the snow cat, to um, show them emotional support on the airplane. People are eager to help Halloran. And he realizes that many of these people have The Shining. And so if The Shining is a kind of psychic gift that human beings have um, to connect them to themselves and to other people around them, it can be exploited, as it is in the Overlook, and by extension exploited in the uh, American consumer society. But this psychic power can also be a source of good um, the community can harness that energy to help each other to do good deeds. Um, it's, it can be a benevolent power. So, um, King wants us to recognize that our psychic powers are not there just to be tapped into and exploited by the upper class and by consumer society, um, but it actually can be there to uh, serve us well and to create a sense of belonging for each one of us. Uh, Kubrick's film, very different message, so if you want to go check that out, um, you'll see it is quite a different uh, take on the psychic energy in the first place. Another point about Halloran, he is what is termed the magical negro, which is a trope that has been used in the past um, portraying African Americans as being somehow magical or gifted with supernatural um, powers. They usually come in, typically in films, to assist the white protagonist, but they have these kinds of, they tap into a magical undercurrent. Now, on the surface, this sounds nice enough. It's 
wonderful to have magic powers, and that does empower these characters in a certain way. But largely it is a negative because it is placing African Americans outside of the normal uh, society. They are somehow different, uh, somehow abnormal or non-human in their uh, capacity. So they are placed, Halloran is clearly placed as being quite different from the white characters, and this happens, uh, especially Jack Torrance, this happens with um, a lot of his dialect, a lot of his slang, the way he uh, carries himself. He's a very stereotypical character. So if there's a criticism to be leveled here against King, it's that Halloran is not a realistic character, a three-dimensional character. He is a kind of stock caricature of um, the African-American who has somehow has powers that makes them different. This is not unusual for King. Uh, if you read The Green Mile, John Coffey is another African-American character who is gifted with all of these magical powers. Um, and so it's something we have to be on the lookout for because it is deeply problematic in the representation of our fellow human beings. Um, this connects us to our final point. This is the point that I want to forecast ahead to the final lecture in which we are uh, discussing the ring, uh, or at least part of the lecture will be discussing the ring. Um, here we see a fear of children. Why are children so powerful? They are, I mean, you can see on the cover here, this is Danny, um, or perhaps Tony, the uh, alter ego. A little bit uh, of a creepy image there. Um, Danny is like Halloran, he's united to Halloran in his ability to tap into the psychic undercurrent. He can see the evil side of the American society and of the Overlook. He recognizes it, he knows it's there, whereas most people are very oblivious to the dark underside. He can see it, which makes him very mobile. He can uh, elude it, he can escape it. Um, and in some, ultimately he cannot be harnessed or exploited by it. He's well aware of what's going on. Danny, quote, knew more and understood more than there was room for in Dr. Edmonds's philosophy. The doctor who tried, this is on page 289, the doctor who tries to explain his condition. Danny is somehow above the laws of science and medicine. He is um, in a plane all his own. This is going to be very important when we think about the ring. There's something about children, they are still tapped into a primal uh, spiritual capacity that adults lose. They become cogs in the machine like Jack, they um, become servants of some ideal or ideology. Um, Children retain the capacity to see things that adults cannot see. In Danny's case, this will make him a kind of uh, heroic figure. In the ring, this will make uh, the children a little bit different. Uh, the, the main child at the heart of the film, um, well, actually, both of the children at the heart of the film, uh, will give a different sensation altogether. Um, and that's something we will have to return to next time. So I hope you enjoyed The Shining. I hope the discussion forum uh, goes crazy and has lots of discussion points about this novel, an extremely important one. Uh, and I will look forward to discussing The Ring next time. Thank you very much.